an Infosys employee lost like four crore rupees to to a scam. So what? No, I just read Elon Musk's biography, and I'm like, dude, what am I doing with my life? You know, like you had a very interesting stat that you once gave, or that less than one percent of people make more than every returns in the market. The whole wealth concentration problem on this planet is just going to accelerate in an AGI kind of a world, right? If I had some money now and I knew this future was coming, should I invest in real estate, gold? In India, real estate. I think me and Nikhil are both quite bearish about this. <laughs> Why? I mean, what are we paying for? One plus open conversations round two today. We have. none other than nitin kamath and today i'm not going to talk about his trading story i'm not going to talk about how did you get here none of that today we're going to talk about the future we're going to talk about what happens if ai comes in it starts taking few jobs what should you invest in we talk about universal basic income we try to theorize on what that number is and then we also ask questions like what happened with finfluencers and sebi is that really going to impact finance businesses Why is Zerodha betting so aggressively on content? And we also get latest insights and updates about the current startup narrative because Nitin's also an investor through his entity Rain Matter and they've learned many lessons investing in founders working with other VCs that we'll hopefully get to learn today. Stay tuned. This is not something you want to miss. Nitin is the myth, the legend. You know, everyone knows him, so I don't need to do an intro again. Nitin, I want to get straight into it. Firstly, thank you so much for coming here. Secondly, I want to start with the most pressing question of the hour, which is, I've been seeing this entire like Sebi influencer thing, right? And I saw your post on Trading Q and A where you had your thoughts on it. But I thought that was a very short post. I wanted to know more about it. I'll tell you what I think, right? I think obviously there are. there are regular influencers then there are people who go and do stock tri- tips right and i think we have to differentiate the two but i also know or maybe this is a narrative that a lot of zerodas you know new user onboarding at least in the past came from many of these influencers and the average person obviously driving traffic do you think this impacts you do, what do you, what do you think of this yeah no thanks thanks for having me here and Uh, show, show, showing me all your fancy, you know, stuff. Uh, yeah. So, see, thing is, we haven't till date spent any money on marketing and advertising. So, every single customer almost has come through a through an influencer, mm-hmm. right? As in, so when we first started Zero, the you know, one of the learnings from my previous after being a trader or a sub broker, etc., is that people don't get up one day and decide to buy and sell stocks. Mm. they're usually influenced by someone uh, mm. so the first thing we had done was actually set up this thing called as a an affiliate program you know so which is when was this 2010 when we the first thing on our website was uprising the second page was affiliate affiliate right because uh, i wanted our customers to talk about us and also get a cut out of it right so uh, in a way you know we were there and doing the same thing much before uh, now the problem i think um, with this whole barrage of content on everyone right i think it everyone trying to build content i think the incentives are kind of a little skewed now is uh, in the in the in the financial world at least people who, maybe across you know people who are louder get more audience right so the incentive is always to be loud and what has happened is because with the the newer generation influencers are people are making these claims which are not real right they're just saying stuff like you know it's easy to make money and This, you know, I bought a Mercedes Benz trading markets. You know, in three you months. You had a you had a very interesting uh, stat that you once gave, or that less than one percent of people, yeah, you know, make money on the markets. I mean, make more than every returns in the market, and uh, and and the thing is, it's not just in the markets, right? I mean, even if you were to pick business, right? We've invested in a lot of businesses. Um, out of every hundred businesses, maybe one actually succeeds. Right? The only easy thing about trading is really getting started trading. Right, because starting business is tough, right? So you you don't really have mass participation of sorts. Um, yeah. So coming back to your influencer thing, I think uh, the problem I had over the last two three years, while it's benefited us as a business, is um, you know influencers setting wrong expectation. Because the problem is, if you set wrong expectation, even if you introduce a customer, he's going to get disappointed very quickly. Mm-hmm. And the problem in the market is, if you get disappointed, you don't come back, right? and you not only not come back you'll probably go influence 10 other people around you to not invest in the markets right and and we've seen this happen in every bull market cycle and i've seen two large cycles the 2007 2008 and the you know the before the dot com one and in both the cycles you know during market the peak of the market you had a lot of activity and then it just falls off cliff because 
there is some form of you know wrong influencing happening in today's world it's a lot more because of social media and you know access to youtube etc but uh, so yeah my problem was that you know is that uh, is that you need to have a check in terms of the kind of content influencers are putting so but it is like i said you know it'll probably any regulation around this will negatively affect the business in the short run but i think one of the things that we've done right at zeroda is that we we constantly thought about long run versus short run and uh, and you rather not have someone open an account get disappointed and not trade for life versus, you don't want them to churn out yeah you don't want them to right and 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 the thing is one customer you know we've seen this historically one customer for us eventually ends up referring at least 25 30 other customers so it's almost like i have a vested interest to ensure that a customer remains active in the markets and the only way he will is if he comes and kind of trades invest with the right expectations in mind interesting and this i think everything flows back to this flood of content that's suddenly going out on the internet right i think even the number of scams have increased because youtube yes it's like 500 600 million people but also whatsapp is huge and everyone has a whatsapp account and you've been so vocal i've seen so many tweets on my timeline of you know nitin saying this person this is a new type of scam this is a new type of scam if you go to instagram there'll be like five accounts that say varun maya and they're all trying to like get people in some trip, crypto scheme or some you know invest i'll give you 5 rupees if you do this activity how do we deal with this it's like a lot of people don't get the information of this is a scam yeah no i mean so so what we have done at zerodha right is that every time we figure that someone's trying to manipulate a stock um, so we have this user experience called nudge so on the trading app itself we build like this alert mechanism so if a customer is trying to buy a stock which is getting manipulated we warn the customer saying you know what there's someone manipulating it it's almost impossible to control what's happening on whatsapp and telegram actually yeah. uh, because at least with youtube there is some trail right as in there'll be some affiliate link or there'll be there'll be something there'll be something you know with telegram and whatsapp there's nothing so it's it's really hard and uh, yeah so i think the best we can do is really uh, like you know intermediaries like us can spot these scams fast and then maybe alert the user that's really the best and uh, but i think sebi has been doing an amazing job taking strict action wherever there's some trail right as in uh, actually go after those people and then and, and and punish them and that's really i think the best way you can solve for this yeah but there's just so many independent actors who sebi just can't go after everyone because these are not technically influencers right these could be like really small accounts that just got your number from some leak so it just feels like it puts everyone in a tough spot and i feel my personal experience with this is when i was like some 19 or 20 there's someone who sent me a message saying i'll sell you a playstation for 5000 rupees brand new playstation you right. know some something they had figured out so they're like i'll sell it at 5000 i got scammed and after that i've been <laughs> I, i am beware of every whatsapp message I'm like I, i i've got screwed once so do you feel like it's a trial by fire you have to get screwed once and then you're just like aware and away i mean you were lucky that it was a 5000 rupees scam right as in how much is the scams now i mean people once they get sucked into it right it can it can go as high i mean other day uh, you know we came across this case an infosys employee you know a friend i think it came in the papers as well lost like 4 crore rupees uh wow. to to a scam you know so what yeah yeah narrate the story how did that happen no i mean uh this was not stock related yeah. but it's someone calling up saying you know your parcel has got stuck at the customs and hmm. and there is some whatever i think narcotics in it and then you know he getting you know fall you know i think he started with 5 lakhs and then just kept adding on i mean no there are a lot of such cases happening right now and hmm. wow it's like now it feels like it's a lot of social engineering and in- i mean it's tough time i mean you ju- what you just showed me on what ai can do i, I it's just it's just ridiculous right as you know, like you can uh, yeah i could run an ad saying hey i'm nitin kamat right please go buy this stock i can do that right now i think is i'm not going to because but there will be some motivated bad actors who will yeah because like many of these repositories some of the ai stuff that i showed you is open source so, so it's it's scary I, so the thing is uh uh we you know during onboarding a customer we have this process called in person verification right we ensure that the person opening the account oh you can is, easily cheat that yeah you know so so now the question is you know there's a question to the entire financial industry right because today we use that in person verification as one of the ways to ensure that person opening the account is the same person now if that can be cheated do you go back to opening physical accounts then 
Because if you go back to opening physical accounts, it's going to have it's going to be a nightmare, like a mega impact on on the entire industry. I mean, banks, brokers, insurance, NBFCs, and all of them. You know, so like, um, so yeah. So it, it'll be interesting to see how regulations around this play out. I think at some point we will ship uh, uh, hardware to people, which is for, maybe for iris verification or thumbprint verification. Because to be very honest, cheating uh, a KYC. on you know a webcam is easy like it's been easy for 4 5 years this is a repository called deepface live where i can put on any face i want and in fact i can just clip out the face from somebody's passport plug it on my face it will cheat the algorithm it will cheat whatever is you know uh, getting you into the into the kyc so i feel it's been possible for a while but now it's like one click yeah it was much harder earlier. also it's like i said when you showed me that video it, i couldn't spot it was fake right as in Uh, I think some of what we had seen, you know, we've seen these cases where uh, we have like a manual check, you know, it's a person sitting and tracking this, and we also have this sending out an OTP, you know, to check the liveliness, etc. But you know, which he has to display, and but yeah, now I think you know we're thinking about it, like how do you how do we solve for this problem? Because uh, I think it'll have to be hardware. You'll have to have a thumbprint. Everyone will need to buy a thumbprint thing, or phones will have it, right? Yeah. Phones can kind of already do it. Yeah, so, but what do you match it against? Yeah. Right. The thing about you know uh, in-person verification is, so you know when you do it. So t- today, typically, you know you look at the photo on Aadhaar and you match it, saying, you know your Aadhaar photo matches with the in-person verification. But if you don't, so you need to have access to some master database of sorts. Do we have that of fingerprints in India? No, with Aadhaar there is biometric as well, but uh, that means then you will have to send the device to the customer, right? Because no customer is going to buy. Like, I think it'll al- already be on phones. Like if you, yeah, I mean today it isn't, but but I'm I'm guessing phones will have to evolve over time. And I see. Yeah. Yeah. What a world we're entering. So so you know this flood of content is like it's very interesting to me, right? Because three years ago, actually pre geo, you wouldn't have expected this, but today the average Indian is spending four five hours a day on video. I mean, you guys are also creating a lot of content now. You have Zing. You have the Zero Da channel. Yeah, Nickel's part, even though it's kind of independent, is still part of the entire ecosystem. Why are you going so crazy on content? And what, also, maybe a follow-up: like, is, is there some insight that you've learned from Nickel's podcast that you could apply broadly to all the content you guys are doing now? So, thing is, um, so right from day one, the first thing I did when we started Zeroda was started blogging, right? And because I knew that the superpower we had as a business right from day one is transparency, right? Because Um, generally, financial services firms are very opaque in the way they work, right? Because you can't have a CEO of a company and coming in just talking whatever he wants, you know. Uh, so we, I knew that it's it's an edge. So we started blogging. So we spent a lot. Of, then Karthik started building Varsity in 2013. So it was all in text, right? And that was really. And I used to spend, I think, from 2011, I, I probably spent like two hours a day talking to journalists until 2017, 18, right? Because the way you get See, you're as a business of money. You're trying to build trust and credibility, right? So you have to build your own content, and and you also want to be, you know, I mean, Economic Times, for example, was is is like you know is a rock star in credibility, right? As in as a you know, so uh, how do you get more features on you know some of the you know mainstream media channels, etc. So, but I think 2016 onwards, the effort started having like a dwindling result of sorts. Um, Why? I think people stopped consuming traditional content. You know, I think that's a switch that started happening from 2016, right? As in uh, the viewership of English business channels started dropping, or uh, you know, people picking up newspapers and reading it stopped. And you know, so you started seeing that happening. And uh, I actually was really late to the social media scene as well. You know, so I, I still don't use Insta. I mean, in the sense I have an account, but I really just you know. Uh, Is that for the sake of it? Yeah. As in, you know, every time I say something in Twitter, I screenshot it. I mean, they, someone in the office screenshots and says, "Nitin, share this." Uh, and uh, so I, I went. I think I started on LinkedIn in 2018. Uh, started on Twitter, I think around 2019. Uh, but until then, I used to really be the you know, person managing so, zero the social media handles. I also realized that, you know, as if something is coming through the business handles, you know, the platforms have started, you know, kind of throttling the reach of sorts. Um, so yeah, so I think all of this plus this YouTube, right? I think I knew 
really early that this is the place to be. Uh, in 2015, I ran a prank in the office. Uh, I, you know, got like these Kannada actors to come raid our office as cops, and you know, we captured this whole thing. And so I knew back then that this is a place to be. And I had like all you know all these random kind of ideas that that Mr. that video Mr. Beast, but zero the hours. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and no one right as in no one would ever think. A, a stock broker running a prank video of cops raiding the office, saying the founder is a cheat and he's run away. You know, I mean, the reaction on that video is just crazy. I think half our office was crying on that day. Um, and uh, uh, but I think in this whole rush of building the business, it was a slip, right? I think uh, we were there before everyone else. Uh, all this focus on content that we are doing right now, I think we should have done it in 2016-17. And uh, I think we lost a little bit on the competition there because some of the newer brokers came in. Because you know, in my head, that whole transition of the primary search moving from Google to YouTube, like it didn't register. You know, like. But you you had some experience. That's the thing, right? Like with new technology, they look like toys in the right, beginning. Right. Like even the AI stuff. If you look at it six months ago, we did some demos six months ago. I was like, okay, it felt like a toy. But it's almost like like. You can't tell whether it's going to transition from a toy to a serious thing. I mean, even even with our business, right? As in, um, in 2020, the AVM, right? You know, total our customers' assets under management was maybe 15,000 crores, right? And uh, I don't think any of our peers, you know, the the bank brokers, looked at it as, as very seriously because they're like, okay, you're making some profits, but what eventually matters is. What is the AUM of the business, right? As in, how much do customers trust you with their assets? Today, it's three and a half lakh crores. Wow. <laughs> you know, so I'm saying it sounds like heavenly numbers to me. No, no, ten thousand crores is not much. You know, I mean, in the sense, it is not. It's not your money, right? It's customers holding assets with you, yeah. right? As in, but at three and a half lakh crores, we are in the league of some of the bank brokers today, right? As in, that's and and I'm guessing today people take us a lot more seriously than I'm not talking about 2010 when no one even realized what we are. I'm talking 2020 when we were decently big as a broker, right? As in, like I keep telling in the office that there is no status quo in today's world, right? As in, uh, everyone's gonna get disrupted, and it's you just have to stay sharp and nimble. As in, there is no other way to build a business. You know? So content is going to be like a big spend for you guys over the next. But the problem is, I don't like, I don't know. Like so today, you know, every day I get up, um, I have five newsletters to look at. I have my Economic Times newspaper. I have. I'm like, dude. I mean, who's? I mean, why are we just adding to the cognitive burden on this planet by just creating more content? Yeah, but I have a counterpoint to this. I watch Nikhil's podcast, and I think that has incredible viewership because it's not just it's not just hey, here's a ten piece seg segment on I don't know some something some industry, right? It's Nikhil grilling the founders <laughs> or like having fun with them. It's like it's also a lot of casual stuff. Feels like coffee with Karan, but you know, business. That is never going to go away because that's not something you need to push on to people. They will come watch it. No, see, thing is, for Nikhil, I think it's his superpower, right? Because I've known him from I mean, childhood. From childhood, <laughs> I'm seven years elder to him. But I think from my time I was in, like maybe seventeen, eighteen, every time I had to go out of go uh, go out in town for a party or etc., he'll say, you know what? I know the owner of this hotel. I know the owner of this. You know, he'll you know he'll he'll not charge you cover charge. You know, why don't you go here? And so that whole socializing. Yeah. And with the right kind of people, I think right now he is probably just two people away from anyone on this planet. You know, in the sense, the degree of separation is just that. So, uh, one is that, and second, as an investor trader, uh, I think I think that whole you need to be curious. There is no other way, right? Every about every industry, every industry. Otherwise, you know, you miss out on opportunities. So that is like almost like his uh, what he does for a living, which is trying to be curious about. You know, Opportunities out there. So this is anyway what he do, but he's doing it on a table. Yeah. But and what I'm saying is, there's no cognitive burden on the user watching. Correct. No, but the thing is, if ten other such channels come up, doing similar stuff, right? Then it is a burden, right? Like I mean, I mean, in a sense, you know, I consume, uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts, and I do it while I'm driving, while I'm working out, while I'm running, and and now I have just come down to maybe two or three. Uh, you know, one is an acquired. Then there is I love I, I binge on history, so uh, you know there is this empire. Um, so that's it because I'm and maybe all in once in a while, but uh, it's just become too much because in in the US the quality of content is so high. Like if you listen to it, you know you want to you can just spend the whole day listening to 
different podcasts right today in india it's easy to stand out but given everyone everyone's interest now to you know kind of be in this game and keep upping the game i don't know i mean i don't know what will help you stand out i mean eventually would you just end up adding cognitive burden and the other problem is if you have a lot of similar kind of content people producing content then you are forced to then up the game and sometimes when upping the game you can take shortcuts or do some stupidity right as make mistakes yeah you know you know like you you try to start pleasing the audience and i think you lost the game right as in yeah you start saying things you don't want to say but you know will pull you over yeah, yeah. you know and and for me being on social media I, i i struggle with that you find it scary i mean stupidly scary as in because i have checks and balances in place in the office you know i have this three people team who have the right to kill everything that i want to say and uh, so i usually draft something sleep over it and i said sa- that's it. a very painful way to use twitter yeah <laughs> so you know yeah. you know on twitter there's a rule right it's called the main character rule yeah. every day on twitter there's one main character right who is getting cancelled right. right who right. is being hung in front of everybody right. else the goal of twitter is to never be the main character you have 365 days a year into whatever 50 years or whatever your goal is to never be the main character the problem is the more famous you are the more envy you generate like one of the questions i was going to ask you is over the last few years especially over the last year is just both you and nikhil right you both catapulted not just as businessmen but also as you know public figures and i feel that will come with its own burdens of the pros are amazing right distribution the cons are also envy the cons are oh my god i've got to be careful about everything i say the cons are you know you have a team around you and you're like cut that cut this cut that it's <laughs> like it's you, you you're being super careful right cognitively how you how do you deal it because to be very honest as a consumer as somebody who actually cares i really want to see you tweet i don't care i, I just want to prove right? <laughs> right, right and i feel like to be very honest i can trust you a lot more because you bootstrap but i've met venture funded founders i've seen them tweet i know what it is like closed doors and you know this thing with you and nikhil it's kind of the same thing No I think I think both of us in a way you know probably genes right I think one of the reasons say my social media works or his podcast works is because there is no real agenda behind it in the sense I I'm okay to go and say stuff that hurts the industry like if you were to ask me about influencers I'm okay to say I'm conflicted and on one hand it probably helps the business but maybe it's not the right thing to be happening maybe there's regulation required right so uh so that, I think just putting out that vulnerability is is all right and that freedom comes actually from not having investors or you know saying get up and you know having to grow every day right as in um so i think i think some people get it wrong by trying to be a little salesy right as in you're you're constantly selling something um i look at my social media as more like it's your personal social media i mean not even that i'm like if something there's something that can help someone else i, I should be going out there and saying it you know if it's about health it's about finance it's about climate whatever you know if i know something or i feel something that's going to help someone else i'll go and say it but i really don't like this where people like you and it's a lot of other people like you who are like i should be very concealed about my thoughts and be very careful because i feel like that's valuable information for the next generation of entrepreneurs to learn from and just because there like a few people who want to i mean sit in the like, day the day i stop being ceo of a regulated business i'll probably do that you know so <laughs> <laughs> you know i mean i was just looking at alon musk you know that interview i'm like just i'm just mind blown you wish this. you could do that it's just like <laughs> the audacity right as in it's just i mean now I, i think uh, especially you know running a regulated business right as in uh, it's it's hard to be you know just out there putting out your point of view i think you have to be in the center you can't take Uh, you can't at least you know you can have you know extreme opinions but i don't think you can go out and publicly can you give me a story of where maybe you said something and the regulation part has actually hurt you no i mean i haven't said it so it's not hurt me <laughs> so, you know but you know the fear is there <laughs> you know so those checks and so the thing is uh, you know uh, like i am like my usual decision making framework is i need to know the worst case outcome before doing anything so i wouldn't i wouldn't have said something Um, I think I've done some stupidity. For example, my last birthday, uh, you know, uh, like I had taken a pic after my workout, and I was like, you know, I'm not going to share this stuff, and because people around me were like, you know, Nitin, you need to share, you need to share, and then uh, you know, Nikhil, me, and a bunch of us got together, had a couple of tequilas, and <laughs> you know, it got shared, and 
but i know that was stupidity but i knew you know i had made peace saying that you know this will probably come across away in right it's okay you know if a 40 plus year old is you know is having some midlife crisis you know it's it's one <laughs> <laughs> you know so uh it's it's but yeah but it's it's really hard you know i have realized when i'm traveling i'm tweeting more yeah i'm on a holiday i'm tweeting more because i am having that kida it's so, dopamine it's not even dopamine it's like oh i'm not working enough let me do something right as you know <laughs> so like if i if you see like a lot of frequency sudden increase in frequency i'm either going through holiday or having some kind of questioning myself on how much value you no know, i just read elon musk's biography and i'm like dude what am i doing with my life you know like you know he's running six businesses working like you know what he says like constantly working you know i'm maybe not working you know and you know so so yeah so every time there is um, questions like that i uh, a lot more questions in my mind i have realized that i'm usually tweeting or sharing more on social media and so yeah i'll tell you a, a, a can slightly cancelable take i have but i think a lot of smart people agree right that ai is just getting better right and there is this let's just say for now a myth of something called artificial general intelligence right. where there will be a day and the definition of ai everyone has different definitions my definition and the definition of companies like open ai is all economically viable work can now be done by one of these systems i do think we're going to get that some point right and on this podcast i want to discuss that future you're the best person to discuss it with because i think a lot of things are going to change because in post agi economics if everything is created you know in abundance what happens to money right and this is a lot of theorizing right, right? so right. you don't have to be right, <laughs> right, right. it's just i would love to hear this from you right yeah no i mean more than money what will you do with your time is a question right as in this is something i keep thinking about because i have a 8 year old son and i'm like you know in a world where he's going to grow up and maybe he'll have more time than anyone you know anyone any human, human has had in the history like what is he doing right you know me and kalash keep talking about this as well um i think it's about finding something meaningful to do which is more important than you know before you think about money right as in like have hobbies it could be something like it could be cooking you know like i i take i have a lot of fun playing music to myself you know i pick up a guitar i sing to myself i don't need an audience right but but that 30 40 minutes i spend with my you know with myself just you know i enjoyed quite a bit i love playing sports so just playing the sport is i think i think people have to first figure that stuff out as in you know you have to assume that you will have more time on your hand figure something to do which will give you some bit of happiness doing right? it can't just be scrolling and watching content all day right as in it has to be something else uh so i think i think first is that now when it comes to money yeah i mean i don't know as in it's a really tough question um it's uh, and also how um, you know will this just accelerate this whole wealth concentration problem right because if you know if a company could generate x amount of wealth with a lakh people if they need only 90000 or say 50000 people so the company's investor just made more wealth you know so the whole wealth concentration problem this on this planet is just going to accelerate in an agi kind of a world right as in i mean forget agi i mean just just where we are in terms of ai i think over the next one two years uh and the thing is historically you know if you look at human kind every time wealth concentration has accelerated it has led to some civil war of sorts yeah right? and uh, you know the precondition for for civil war is the the old nobles have to fall right so right now the current correct. white collar workers have to fall and it's so sad that ai is coming for them for in a way right like people right. like me right so uh, the old nobles get very dissatisfied and they have connections one degree connections to the you know the elite right. and that causes like society just collapse internally right um but what do you think is going to be more valuable would you okay actually i'll ask you right uh, real estate you think if i if i had some money now let's assume and i knew this future was coming should i invest in real estate gold i mean in india real estate i think me and nikhil are both quite bearish about this you know right. so i mean wh- what are we paying for right as in um like you know when we set up a foundation in 2020 and the first project we picked up was a restoration project and uh, it's a 100 acre piece of land next to the forest in krishnagiri and so you know this guy was trying to turn it into a villa project and he said dude you know you have elephants coming here bears coming here and all you know this endangered species you know you can't turn this into a villa project right <laughs> <laughs> you know so so he said let's kind of take this and restore it so and then he started asking for a price it's in the middle of nowhere the land has zero yield you can't grow nothing you know you know I'm like you know how are you as in what is the logic for asking 
say, a 20 lakh rupees an acre in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, it's just that and, and, and makes absolutely no sense. And the problem of this inflated land prices in the country, is it's also hurting the economy uh, because through the foundation, we work with social sector, which is, you know, working with a lot of people, you know, working in the villages, etc. And a lot of farmers today have this notional value of their land. Hmm. Now think about it, right? You know, if your land is worth 20 lakhs an acre, would you work for a year to generate 20,000 rupees from it? You wouldn't. You will say, let me just sell half of it and live off it for the next 10 years. Hmm. Right? As in, why would so someone... So the incentive system is bad there. Yeah. And it's all, the root cause is the land price, is this inflated land price. Let's see, the way you need to look at land is very similar to how you would look at a business. Right? Say if you, uh, you know, if you can rent an apartment for say 25,000 rupees a month, or uh, say three lakh rupees a year, it should, you know, that apartment can't be costing more than or like 5% or if you assume as a lead, uh, yield, you know, it shouldn't be costing more than say 75 lakh rupees. You can't be spending two crore rupees on an apartment and be earning three lakh rupees. Right? It doesn't make, it, the math doesn't add up. You know? So, so yeah, so I think, I think the land prices in the country are, in, you know, are inflated. So in a world like this, it doesn't, I, I wouldn't be investing in real estate. But the question is, let's say the salary tab goes to zero. You mm. can't rent. Right. You know, at some point in the future, you can't actually rent right. this. So in that scenario, would you go spend all your money investing? See, the thing is, everyone needs a house for sure. Right. I, I mean, like to house to live in is, it, non I it's a non-negotiable. I mean, it's just peace of mind. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's going to give you freedom to do a lot more in your life. So absolutely everyone needs to go buy a house. You know, uh, like one place to call, I think you uh, call it a home and, but as an investment, it wouldn't make sense. Uh, Got so. it. Got I mean, if you also the thing is India is not getting younger anymore, right? As in while we have this demographics on our side, I think 10, 20 years from now will be an older population as well. I mean, if you go to Europe right now, like countries like Italy, average is like closing on 50 years. And I mean, you can buy a village for what you pay for an apartment here, you know, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So. Because there are no people, right? See, in uncertain times, historically, gold has worked. Yeah. Right? So you'd bet on gold. I mean, if I had to like keep money somewhere, yeah. like, uh, I think gold is not, I mean, not as jewelry, of course, right? Uh, buy some gold ETFs, buy some gold bees or whatever. I mean, it, it, it I mean, usually everyone's West. I mean, it's not like I don't have real estate, uh, but everyone is invested in real estate. So people don't like listening to, Someone having a negative view on real estate. Oh, that's okay. Right. <laughs> you're not, you're not going to get cancelled for this. But, but okay, gold, real estate, what else? Would you still invest in mutual funds? You have I to mean, put on the bootstrap hat right now, <laughs> right, not the, right. the hat. I'm saying like right. 10 years down the line right. when things get really bad. If see, they get bad. See, the thing is, you have to, if, like I said, AI, I think is going to just help companies become more efficient, right? Yeah. Which means they'll probably start generating more income, not across all companies, but I think it's, you probably start picking up companies and indices, which will benefit out of efficiency, right? As in, and, uh, but the thing is, I think the overall impact on the, on humanity will be so large. So I don't know if we can just pick up pockets of, you know, companies and say, you know what, somehow I'll beat it, you know? So I think everyone will get affected, right? As in, yeah. So, uh, so I don't know. I don't know. Uh, see, I'm I'm invested in the markets. So uh, in a sense, all my net worth is tied to how Indian markets do. Uh, yeah. So in a way, I'm conflicted there as well. So uh, I'm I'm extremely bullish on India because generally, you know, we're a, we're one of the last few countries that are still growing. Yeah. Uh, um, we seem to have good demographics. So I don't know. I mean, how AI is the you know the joker in the pack. You know, like how that'll impact all of this, but, uh, but if it impacts India, it's going to impact everyone, like including the rest of the world. Right, right. Yeah. I think India has done a great job of telling the story of India. Right. You, you put a tweet on this, that Americans want to invest in India. Americans don't want to invest in America. Right. America is so torn right. on social media right. that everyone feels like shit. We're living in a dumpster. It's not actually yeah, like no, that, no, right? On, but the narrative has gotten really bad, but India, this is tight control of narrative externally exporting the narrative. They've done a good job. So it feels like, I know people from outside are like, is there a way to get into India? Right. So that's, <laughs> I think, yeah. your tweet said that. Yeah, no, also, no, see, the thing is, um, so I have friends, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we all have friends, right? But I, I, I take great interest in figuring out 
what Indians are doing outside India, and because it's a potential target market for us, we don't have a product for for them today, uh, because um, it's very hard for an NRI to be investing in India. So we're trying to solve for some of it, but that that business interest is there to figure what Indians are doing with their wealth outside, and you know what is the kind of life they're leading, etc. I mean, I think you know what you're seeing in Europe. I mean, this whole you know countries moving to the right. You know, this whole nationalism, nationalization, nationalism coming to the forefront. Right? As in, I think, like in the last three months, I have had three people that I know who have been mugged in the U.S. Right, Indians, right, just for the color of the skin, right, and and of course they were in the wrong neighborhood. Because you made everything about race. Yeah, you know, so it's just becoming that, and it's just, I think, you know, and it's always just one incident away, right? I don't know what will be that one incident that will just make it all. You know, nasty, right? And um, US is at least all right, but I think Europe, for example, is in a much, you know, trickier spot for immigrants and etc. So, so yeah. So my question usually, you know, for people going around the country is, see, the education is anyways not valuable, right? As in, in a sense, I mean, you probably can find it all for free, right? As in, you're going there as a as a as a way to get a job, right? And but you don't want them to settle there. Yeah, <laughs> like that's that's just when you're this thing. Never yeah. settle there. No, but it's not possible. Once you spend so much money on that education, you have to settle there to make it back, yeah. right? So I mean, I I I don't want the smartest people of this country to go out of the country, right? As in, it's uh, so you know, if you would ask me what excites me most about Zerodha, the fact that we are helping India financialize, right? As in, today our customers, like I was saying, hold like three three and a half lakh crores of securities with us. Otherwise, this money could potentially have been in I don't know. Real estate or gold or fixed deposits, where it's not really helping the economy in any way. I think what India needs is this whole culture of Indians investing in entrepreneurs, right? And usually the first step of this is public markets, right? I mean, if yeah. you invest in stocks, you then start questioning, oh, is there a way to invest in a company early, right? As in, then you know your friend comes to you and says, you know what, I have a business idea, uh, and if you have the money, you're, you know, you think, oh. Maybe I should give some money to this person, right? And so you think it'll move from public markets to like seed in all the way to seed in? Absolutely, as in, I mean, that's what we want. I mean, that's the hope. I mean, that's why I get up every day excited about Zerodha saying. You think if if there was a way to allow the public markets to invest in early stage companies, you would facilitate that? Absolutely. So as in, uh, I think one of the big problems I have is like so there is I think what sixty seventy billion dollars of uh, money that got invested in the Indian startup ecosystem, and ninety percent of that is foreign. Right, which also means that ninety percent of the, all the wealth was get got created outside India, right? And historically, I don't think any country has gotten wealthy with wealth getting created somewhere else, right? I mean, it's another form of East India Company, right? As in, if and of course, you know, East India gave us railroads, English spoons, etc. But all the wealth got created somewhere else, right? As in, so you know, if we want this country to get inclusively rich, we need Indians to be backing Indian entrepreneurs, right? And Uh, and that's really uh, the core of, like you know, I mean, the only reason I am still so excited about everything that we're doing at Zerodha or at Rain Matter, etc., because everything is just saying that you know the outcome of that is 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 potentially this happening. Okay, so help me do some math. Okay, post AGI math. Let's say there is universal basic income. Let's say people lose a lot of people lose their livelihood, and the government says, okay, I'm going to give you some money. The first and most obvious problem I see with this is that. If there's a two-party system, everyone says my number is six thousand. Next guy says my number is seven thousand. But if you were, you know, with all your experience, what is the number do you think that every person in India or every household would get? Let's say if AGI happened tomorrow. No, I think I think before that number, I think you need public goods in this country, right? You need, you know, your basic, which is your education, your medical, your infra, like your transport, your food. That has to be taken care of. You know, I don't think. uh you know you should even talk about ubi until you have all of that in place right as in and so you're uh, saying first universal basic resources in a way yeah. you give everyone certain you you would give everyone certain resources yeah access to the resource you know without having to you know like how some of the nordic countries have done it right as in you you shouldn't be getting up and saying i don't have you know i don't have money to send my school, kid to the school that shouldn't happen you know everyone should have access to education everyone should have access to um you know to to be able to move from one place to another uh without having to buy a car and etc so it's uh, i think those public goods have to be kind of first worked on mm-hmm. after that what is really the number that's required i don't know i mean it's a it's just 
I don't even know if I'm qualified to call that number. It's because, fine. It's fine. Like, right. uh, most likely, it's not going to be the number. Yeah. But no, no. But I'm saying I would like to hear your viewpoint on it. Yeah, I mean, see, the thing is, is government does government have access to you know that kind of resource to pay everyone that number? I mean, that is a math government will have to do, yeah. right? Um, but I think I think there are some of these things in India, right, which you can potentially tweak around. Uh, which can actually help government uh, get access to a lot of resources like your wealth tax, inheritance tax, tax the rich farmers. Do so you think the taxes will go up? It has to, right? I mean, where else will the money come from? As in, there is, if you want to cover for everyone and you want to spend so much on the infra and public goods, is it, money has to come from somewhere. And um, I personally think inheritance taxes, I mean, no person who's financially made it would say it, but I think it's almost unfair not to have inheritance tax. Right, because um, you know, I've realized that as as you you know as you keep concentrating wealth, it just becomes so much more easier to make money, right? As in, I mean, today it's a lot more easier for me to make I don't know like a million dollars compared to what it was ten years back, yeah. right? And so the thing is, so then it keeps getting easier for the guys on the top, right? And then you know if you can if you keep passing on that wealth generationally from one generation to another, I don't know, it's it's just skewed. Against the overall, you know, but you're right. Inheritance, inheritance tax. No, I mean, in the sense, it has to. You have to, you know, every time wealth change hands, there has to be some distribution of it, right? I'm saying, because then it it kind of it helps the society as well. You know, I mean, if you're assuming that eventually there is going to be a civil war at some point, right? Because this concentration of wealth at some point is going to lead to civil war. Like an inheritance tax actually slows down the problem, right? Because then the janta knows that. You know, something's being done. Something's being done. Right? It's you know, it's it's you know counterintuitive, but I think it's it's smart to have something like this uh, because uh, then you know you're not kind of pushing the society to that brink of sorts. You know, if you can, like it's cities, right? I mean, of course, you know, if you're in a village, you can survive with lesser. So I th- I think it's a maybe a, a per capita. I don't know from where the money will come. You know, if you have to give like you know two two and a half thousand dollars to every. Individual a year. Yeah, I mean, we'll have to figure out. I mean, that also has to be there, right? There has to be money to be able to be paid out as well. Yes. Yeah, sounds scary. And do you feel like in this world, with all the abundance, with all the free time, what what do you think you will do? I'm loving my binging into history, uh, my music, my sports, and and also you know just spending time with my son to help him figure what he will do with his free time when he's because he'll probably have a lot more time to lead in a world where. You'll have a lot of free time, you know, and uh, I'm constantly trying to pick up on hobbies, uh, uh, which will just keeps me excited. And uh, and also with what we do through Rain Matter, I I probably spend like ten, twenty percent of my time on that, uh, both on the foundation, the climate side or the investing side. Both sides, you know. I mean, the the way we think about it is like how for profits can solve for some of the problems. The social sector also can solve for some problems. Think of about the government, right? Running a go- country is really really hard. Right, you know, I mean, I find it really hard running Zeroda, which is probably like twelve hundred people. Right, I mean, you know, think of a country of one fifty crores. Is in how does the government run it? Uh, the way we think about social sector is, you know, they go experiment, pick up small problems, experiment, you know, kind of have MVPs of sorts, show the results to the government, and see if you can then help the government make right decisions. Right, I mean, that's how we think of social sector, and because. Eventually, the biggest impact is when the government acts. I mean, you can do any amount of donation philanthropy; it makes no difference. I mean, the entire India philanthropy is maybe less than how much Maharashtra spends on education, right? In the sense, it will, you know, it is, it can never match up, you know, whatever money you spend. So yeah, I spend ten, twenty percent of my time on this, but it adds a lot of meaning on the remaining seventy, eighty percent of my life, right? As in, otherwise, you know, I would probably be just questioning, saying, "What am I doing with my life?" <laughs> yeah. Uh, You've been investing through Rain Matter for a very long time, and you've been very vocal about the the entire ecosystem, right? You've been very vocal about the fact that startups are overvalued, that there's now an incentive problem because of liquidation preference. You know, the tweet that you put up was great, but I'd like like you to expand upon it because I'll tell you what I've noticed now. It's strange. VCs always want to be told because they're also selling it to you know the the private equity funds outside that India is a big market. That everything in India is like you know the, the math is always based on the kind of the YouTube math, right? Six hundred million people on YouTube, eight hundred million people on phones and internet, and therefore you'll have this many transacting users. Right. I feel like now founders are going out 
and telling VCs, VCs who who say that hey, it's a market's large. Founders are now saying no, markets are not large, which is strange because founders actually need to tell that story if they want to raise venture capital. Otherwise, it makes no sense to raise venture capital, right? You can cannot build a big outcome business. So my question to you is, you've learned thousands of lessons. What is like three lessons you think everyone should know? Yeah, no, I mean, I think just be real. You know, this the problem I've realized is this. Um, Is that you know as a I mean as as people building businesses right we are storytellers right? right and sometimes we oversell right? right and it's very easy to that oversold story to think that it's real you know I mean you keep saying the same story many times you just reinforce it somehow right as and you start believing in the story like you no know, there are people like for example in our industry experienced folks who come to me and said Nathan there are I don't know ten crore people who have demand accounts today and. In three years, four years, there'll be forty crores. And I'm like, what are you smoking? I mean, like, where are this, you know, where are the remaining thirty crore people who don't have money to put food on the table start investing in the markets? Right? As in, like, what is going to transform around the world that's going to make this happen? So, so the thing is, the the problem is, if you set wrong expectations to yourself, to your team, to your investors, then you're forced to go meet that expectation, and that's really the problem. I mean, once you set the wrong goals. You're just you're just chasing something which is not out there, right? And it's very hard to get there. And then, you know, if you see all the people overspending on acquiring customers or um, giving stupid deals to retain customers, I mean, all of this is just to meet up to a wrong expectation that was set to an investor. So if there is a correction there, if founders are going out there and telling more real stories to the investors, that's amazing. You know, I mean, more of that should happen and. Um, but do you also feel like when you set very correct expectations in india which i think people should also we start seeing many of these billion dollar opportunities disappear yeah i don't think i don't think today you can have as many unicorns as we had last year right as in instance india isn't such a large market yet the bet is that it will be in the future at some point of time and and we all want that to happen but it isn't and it's 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 okay i mean see the thing is you know we're building a country and there is no quick way to do this and um i i mean i still can't get the obsession with the word unicorn i don't think now anyone cares no but like you know for a while i think everyone media frenzy was <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. like now unicorn has almost become like you know like people get scared in us of the word unicorn so i don't think unicorn people care but uh, but But yeah, no. I, I mean, it, it is corrected, and it's it's for the better. But it's very hard to say. I mean, it's certainly there's you know today it's corrected because there's not enough capital available. If, if tomorrow VCs again go into the frenzy of deploying capital into India, it would not correct. It'll just go back to the same thing, right? Because then no. But I think now founders are wiser. Second time, third time, founders are wiser. Mm, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> no, I mean, I think it is. It's just you know they're all playing. by the market of sorts you know they know that today's market being real is what will probably get them dollars if, as because the dollars are not available for people who are exaggerating yeah. but if tomorrow it's again one of those you know times where vcs are flush with money and they have to deploy and their deployment is going to be based on who's going to sell the most exaggerated story yeah. we'll probably go back i mean we have seen this happen cyclically it's not like You know, it's a new phenomenon. Yeah, it's like you know, I mean, India VC, you know, isn't more than a ten-year-old phenomenon. But if you look at VCs in the US, it keeps happening. You know, every cycle. You know, it happened in two thousand seven. It happened during dot com. It can have. It happened. You know, twenty twenty and twenty twenty one. So it, you know, every ten years, fifteen years, you have that one cycle where, you know, people think, oh, you know, what all entrepreneurs are, you know, are wiser now and they will not do any of those mistakes. But eventually. You know, there is greed. There is you know, with all of these things around. You know, we'll end up doing. I think entrepreneurs end up doing the same mistakes over and over again. So. And you, what do you think about the current entrepreneurs who are kind of stuck there, like who've raised a lot of money, who have like fifty million in the bank, hundred million in the bank, but mentally checking out? Are you seeing a lot of that? Yeah, I mean, it's like being in a bad marriage, right? And 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 like I said, you know, a bad marriage is when you marry someone setting the wrong expectation. Right? Mm. I mean, you go out on a few dates and you make yourself to be like this. Person who you aren't, and then you know the, the the partner realizes you aren't this person. Then it's a bad marriage, and and it's very really hard to get out of a bad marriage. You know. And so are, are the founders in a bad marriage with the idea or the investors or the money? With the the investors, but then that kind of that that you know that spreads out to everything, right? But once you're you know you can't just get away from it, right? You can't if you've taken money, it's an obligation you have. You can't say you know what I'm going to just switch off and do something else tomorrow, right? As in, you're you're kind of stuck and. Uh, 
you know once you raise the money you've sold a dream to your team which is actually the hardest part of the business you know investors you probably meet once in a quarter in a closed room right now if you've sold you know you've missed sold uh, ex- you know to your team that's when you have to look at the faces yeah but i think good founders take care of the teams no matter what but the thing is you take care of them but then if you've sold wrong dreams mm. you know the root cause of all of this is money right as in too much of money and any time there is excess capital it just has all these weird outcomes um, i think for even for a founder i think you know when you said lessons the other i think the big lesson here is to is is too much of money is a problem because then you know you want to go after too many opportunities you lose for extremely ambitious yeah i mean you have this key of wanting to do everything and you know assuming that money can somehow solve for all problems and money doesn't money rarely solves for anything at all in life so the way you know my mental framework at zeroda has been that all these moonshots that comes as you know ideas etc we'll do it through rain matter we'll invest in it yeah rather than trying to do it ourselves because otherwise almost all the fintech investments that we have done we could have just built it ourselves right? but if we had attempted that i think we would have lost focus on our core product right and and also you need founders to run the new right. ships yeah i mean of course but thing is even what is the what's the worst that can happen i lose that money invested right i mean that's really the worst that can happen right but if you if i had attempted that idea i would have probably lost on my core product offering as well which means i would have probably potentially hurt my business as well so i mean that's how we have thought about it zero that saying that anything which is adjacent to what we do as a business let's just partner with us trying to do this ourselves and it's interesting i mean it's a lot of i've been a founder myself right so i've been through some of this not at the scales that many other people have played at but still very interesting to learn these lessons i wish somebody came and told me these like 10 years ago right um yeah no i mean this is not like you know i was born with it this is all learned from mistakes itself <laughs> interesting and how do you correct this do you think staging is like a better idea do you think like we should have set stages like a seed only goes till here a series a only goes till here second time founder premium is not as high well, how do you like if you had to change it what would you do in the last one or two years you know a lot of blame has been put on the indian founder uh i think i think the blame lies as much on the investor because you know the investor is the one who's experienced whose time i mean the only thing the investor is doing is sitting and thinking right he is not he's got not, no other job right i mean he's just thinking and deploying capital which is a founder has thousand things to do right as in like you have to run a business take care of the team all of this so i think it's the investor who has to be setting the expectations right so if um i don't know what can be done to fix it uh, but uh, i think uh, india needs like a bunch of good vcs who who you know who temper down expectations go out and communicate correctly and um i think i'll help the com- i mean like when i say some of these things right as in on social media it is uh, i know that i have the privilege to say some of these things because um but many vcs can't like i'm sure a lot of vcs think this but they've also raised capital they have lps like i empathize with everybody right. like i feel like it's money that becomes the villain in all of this right but i empathize with everybody i'm like as a founder you have like a million things to do as a vc you you've also told a story to raise lp capital lp is limited partners so right. vcs don't invest their own money they they raise money from other people so it's just yeah it's a, it's a it's yeah. a messy thing and the media is obviously celebrating unicorns no but media enjoys the the downward journey more than the upward journey you know so it's uh, uh i think there is no i think they do both no mo- enjoyment is more from downward for sure the number of views for all the good news you know the viewership they got for the good news on edtech probably will be a fraction of all the bad news they get on edtech right you know so it's a uh, you have opinions on that on on, on me- how the media on that media cycle no works? but that's see the thing is that's you know even today the, the thing about that's the game that's you know you're going to do what you're going to get more viewership right as in and and that's you know coming back to the whole influencer topic right that's a problem you know which is If you're going to do what's going to get you more views, you have an incentive to just be loud and say things which are not real, right? Because the louder you are, the more audience you get, right? And uh, it leads to kind of bad outcomes. And but I don't know. I mean, I don't know what's the right way to fix these problems. Interesting. I have one last question for you. There are competitors that Jarada has, and I think obviously they're nowhere close in terms of revenue or you know bat, but they are making headwind in terms, or rather, they are making progress in terms of you know user growth. Do you guys think about this? Of course. I mean, 
Yeah. And do you, do you think that at some point you might change the advertising, no advertising strategy? Are you hard set on that? Yeah. See, the thing is, today, as a rather, we don't have a product for someone who doesn't have an intent to invest or trade, right? I mean, so we, you know, what we have at Zeroda is if you have an intent to invest or trade, we have a platform, we have many platforms. If you have an intent to learn how to trade, we have education, you know, a bunch of things around education. But if you're someone who, who don't have either, we don't really have a product for you, right? And so today, since we don't have a mass market product that I can, you know, go and on the street and sell it to anyone, I don't, I don't see the point of advertising, right? I mean, um, and now advertising, you know, regulation, you know, in a regulated business like ours, we, we are not allowed to sell greed, right? In the sense, you can't go advertise saying you can make money with me or you can make money quickly, et cetera. So what are you advertising? You're really advertising saying, um, you know, my platform is the best. I'm the cheapest, which is what everyone advertises. Then how do you really stand out by marketing and advertising? One is that. The second problem is, I don't see the thing is this is how we've thought about it. Right? I don't know if it's the right way to think about it or not. Uh, the second problem is today when a customer comes to us, we don't have a CAC, right? That means I'm not thinking, oh, I spent two thousand rupees to acquire this customer. I need to recover this from the customer. Mm. So you don't do shady things. It's not even shady, as in so there is no you know in, internally in our business there is no one thinking of a customer as revenue, right? And in a financial services business, if you start thinking of every customer as revenue, you can potentially do stuff which is not right for the customer, right? I mean, walk into a bank today, you'll come out with a bad product. Someone would have sold you something which is not right because everyone's in the bank constantly thinking about a certain revenue. I pulled an insight out of this. Right. Uh, you have to tell me if it generalizes. But if you have no CAC, mm -hmm. if you have zero CAC, then you can do better for your customers. Absolutely. In, across any field, any right? because you don't have to, you know, monetize each and every customer. That's incredible. That's yeah. why in the US, a lot of these businesses built on top of YouTube. Right. But they have no CAC. Right. Treat their customers a lot better. Yeah, it is. I mean, I mean, it's it's a superpower. Like, you know, I know my peers who think of customers as 2,000, 3,000 rupees CAC and want to generate it as quickly as possible. And that's a wrong place to be, right? Because you will just turn out your customers. So, like I said, of course, in short terms, it can seem like it's adding user growth, adding revenue. But that can all just disappear in no time, right? Because these are all users whom you are churning away because, you know, Getting, them to yeah to do. do more and also the second thing is you know at zero the i think the core philosophy has been never do to a customer what you don't want done to you right so, so like i hate spam you know? i mean like right now i'm i'm just so frustrated i mean every day i'm spending maybe 15 minutes just marking emails as spam i'm like i'm like are there more spam bots out there than humans you know like sometimes i wonder right because i get more emails from spam oh, it's going to get much worse <laughs> right you know i mean even with all those filters etc in place with google even even after that right as in uh so uh, so yeah so like so today we have taken a stance as Zerola, saying that we will not send any spam to our customer i won't send a push notification unless the customer wants it right could i have taken the stance if if i'd spent 2000 3000 rupees on a customer maybe not right and eventually, if I have to think about it in the long run, every business needs a moat, right? As in, you need to be able to do, say and do things which is hard for others to say and do. I don't think any of my peers will be able to say the last two minutes, three minutes of what I just said, right? And and if you- That's the bootstrap superpower. So you guys have multiple superpowers. Bootstrap, then look, zero CAC. This, see, the thing is, I think even if you had investors, right, who are aligned, because in this, the business has done well, right? It's not like the business hasn't done well. I don't think it would have been a problem even if we had investors who are, who are in it for the right expectations. Uh, or investors who are happy with moderate growth, right? Who are not pushing you every year to keep growing, right? As in, if you had right investors, I think you, st you can still build a business following some of these policies, philosophies. But as soon as you start spending money on CAC, right? I have seen it, it changes the genes of the business, right? Everyone in the business is now used to spending money to acquire customers. When you don't have to spend money on a customer, you have to think about new products, your new, how do you keep your support up? You know, because all of those yeah, challenges- Margins are much better, no? Yeah, I mean- my, Better mar margins, someone, yeah. someone said this, better margins lead to better businesses, better yeah. culture, sorry. So the thing is, so, you know, until this math, until 2022, so in 12 years, we had gotten to, I think, accrue customers. If I had spent, we had spent three to 4,000 rupees a customer to acquire, that would have been around 4,000 crores. That was all the profits we had made in two, 12 years, right? So 11, 12 years. So that means if we had spent three to 4,000 rupees a customer, we you would, would not be, be profitable. 
Wow. You know, so it's, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, if people are- Wow, so your CAC is your margin. It's a different way of looking at it, but uh, but yeah, it is, it is that. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. Nitin, thank you so much for being here. This was lovely. I learned so much. And I think there are very few people who can publicly say what you say. And I think to me, the people who can actually do that are the people I want to chat with, right? Paradoxically. Because <laughs> I'm like, see, tell me the truth. I don't want like something, you know, corporate speak. Thank you so much for being here. One of the cool things we do on the show when we end, it's a ritual. It's like, it's in my, this thing of making it an experience for everybody that comes because I kind of took your time, right? Is I give everyone a brand new phone. Oh, sweet. <laughs> <a brand new laughs> no, phone. Cheers, cheers. It's for you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you so much. And I hope we get to do this again. No, thank thanks, you. thanks, thanks for thanks for having me here. Hopefully this was useful. <laughs> that was a very insightful conversation because personally, I learned so much. And I think meeting some of these people, you just be a student in front of them, you will, you absorb so much. And I'm financially illiterate. We learned how founders are thinking now that the entire narrative of unicorn is going down. We learned a lot of things about how the economy might change after artificial general intelligence. And to be very honest, I learned so much. And I think just being a student in front of people like Nitin is an honor. The ability to learn, the ability to absorb. I'm just grateful for the opportunity. So that's it for me. Bye.